Welcome to Glad Tidings Church Online. I'm Pastor Eric Revy, lead pastor of Glad Tidings Church. If you like this video, please click on the subscribe button and click the bell notification and change the notifications to all. That way you will always be notified when we upload a new video and you don't want to miss them. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, you can do so by going to our website, gladtidingschurch.ca. Once again, thank you for joining us and may you enjoy this experience. I am so glad to see you. Uh, it's great to see. Uh, again, it's always great to preach to a live audience and to sing with a live audience is to, uh, to not. Uh, so I'm so glad you're here. We just, we're changing the guidelines and the rules as often as, well, at least I hope as often as you change your underwear. Uh, um, but we're thankful um, with some of our Zoom meetings that some pastors had with our uh, political leaders, uh, they have deemed uh, church as an essential service now, so we are thrilled with that. Uh, at least on that, a couple of weeks ago on Monday, Doug Ford mentioned how important church is and how essential it is, so we are thankful for that. Uh, we're also thankful we're able to meet here. Now, we do have guidelines and restrictions that we need to do, uh, and they will be changing uh, often. I'm just going to let you know. Uh, we want to encourage you, if you are going to sing, uh, you, we have several options. You either need to wear a face mask if you are uh, within six feet of somebody. Uh, if you're not going to wear a face mask, we have other options. We've got the front row. That's one way to get people to come to the front. Uh, or if you're going to make sure that you are nine feet away. Now, households are okay together. Uh, if you are within closer than nine feet from someone that's not of your household, then please, um, we're all adults here. We don't need to be told. Just make sure and look if I'm, okay, I'm, like if I'm up here like this to Dan and I'm singing my lungs out and realize I'm not wearing a mask, I need to just say, okay, I got to be about nine feet away just to make sure that everything. We want to follow the guidelines because we want to respect what our government leaders have told us, uh, you know, and now we're just thankful we're able to be here. Amen? So uh, I want to encourage you to do it. We have face masks. Uh, we have been given a good supply of face masks, and we want to encourage you that if you want to wear a face mask, please do so. If you, again, I, I have to say this, if you are singing uh, and you're closer than nine feet away from someone not of your household, please put on a face mask and then sing your heart out or move yourself nine feet away. Uh, we also are recording this for those who are going to be watching it online later. We have people in the parking lot as well. Uh, we do have set up as more and more people come to the church. Uh, just in case you're wondering, okay, if I get there late, I won't have room. If it fills up, we have a secondary auditorium or gymnasium we have turned over. Amanda's going to lead us in some worship. Uh, this is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Let's give them a round of applause. And uh, so let's open up with the service of prayer that Amanda and Timo are going to lead us in some praise. Father, we thank you uh, for the privilege and the honor. I ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you that we're able to gather here today. We thank you that you have made it so that we can be in this building and worshiping you uh, with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And Lord, I pray, Lord, we again are praying. Uh, Father, we're seeing signs of, of, of more cases down in Florida and different places around. Lord God, we ask for you to bring an end to this virus. We pray that you would stop it in its tracks. We pray for a miracle. God, we need you to heal our land. So we ask you to heal our land. And Father, we look to you. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, touch your people. And Lord, as we are gathered here today, as those that are in this auditorium, those may be in the parking lot, those that might be watching this later on this afternoon online, I pray that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit would just touch each person's heart. That God, that you would meet them right where they are. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Why don't you stand with us if you can and let's worship the Lord. Amen. for this all week. Excited. What's not to love about you? Heaven and earth adore you. Kings and kingdoms bow down. Son of God, you are the
Wonder, 
spoke a word that you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathe your life in me Jesus you have been so so kind Till I'm found in 
It's the ninety-nine, and I couldn't learn it. Why don't deserve it? Still, you give yourself away. Holy, overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. It's the
declare it to him today. That is who you are. 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 He is the way maker, sing it. special day for me and for my family. I got a text from my son Matthew saying happy Father's Day. He was out with some friends and got home a little late. He says, surprise, my Father's Day gift to you is no cancer. Because, yes, thank God. Because it was one year ago on Father's Day that I got up like every other Sunday morning and got dressed, got out early. I usually arrive to the church building about 7.30 in the morning. And anybody who wants a ride has to come with me at that time or you don't get a ride. So I picked up a couple people and on my way, and on my way out the door, I noticed my son's car was missing and I knew that he was having some pain and discomfort with things going on. So I texted him and said, uh, Matt, where are you? What's going on? He texted me back and said, well, I'm in the emergency because the pain was too much. I had to bring myself to the emergency room. I said, okay, anything I can do? He said, no, not right now. I'm just waiting for tests to come back, et cetera, et cetera. I said, okay, well, let us know if you're still there. By the time we're done with the service, we'll come and see you. It was Father's Day. I had a service to do. There was a baby dedication. Actually, Liam was being dedicated that Sunday. And we didn't hear anything else. My wife came. She was supposed to lead worship that Sunday morning. We're getting text messages from Matthew saying, the doctors say you need to come in. You need to come in now. So she left and went. And you remember I, I said I did the service. And after service, I left and went. And that started us on a journey that was very unique for us and our family. And I'll say it again. I remember sitting in that emergency room on Father's Day. And the doctor looking at us and saying, we believe that your son, we are diagnosing him with some form of acute rare cancer. And she looked at us because we weren't breaking down and freaking out at the time. She said, I don't think you understand the gravity of what I've told you. My wife said, yes, we fully understand. And I looked at her and I said, you do what we do, you do, and we will do what we do when we pray. That led us on a journey that changed my prayer life for the rest of my life. I'll never be the same. And through a journey, I won't go into all the details because trust me, there are a lot of details. But God, that song there, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, my God, that's who you are. And watching the power of God, watching the miracle-working, way-maker, almighty God come through time after time after time was literally mind-blowing. I would love to say that every time was a, a gigantic step of faith. There was times we had a moment, just like any family in crisis will have their moments where you say, God, where are you? What's going on? hoping I can get through Father's Day today because this day I remember on June 18th it was a Thursday when sorry July 18th when the radiologist said if you don't do something now you will be managing pain by October your son would be dead before Christmas so 
not something you want to hear. But the miracle worker, way maker, promise keeper, God came through. And today I'm not celebrating or remembering Father's Day minus one of my children. And going through experiencing my first Father's Day without my oldest son because he died. I'm celebrating Father's Day today because God gave me my son back. I claim the promise my son will live, he will not die. I claim the promise of God, I stood upon the word. And what, were there times where I doubted? Yes, there was. Were there times where I was angry at God? Yes, there was. Were there times I was angry at everything in general? Yes, there was. But this song is one of the songs that I played over and over and over again. I mean, I put it on the, my computer on there, and I cranked it up. I, I got here hours before the staff did, and I still had it on. Like, I mean, I had it good and loud. And I put it on loop, and I just played it over and over because I needed to get that into my spirit. I want to encourage you today. I don't know what you might be facing. I don't know what challenges might be going on in your life, whether you're here in our church building or watching us online or you're sitting in the vehicle in our parking lot. We have people sitting in the vehicle right now in the parking lot listening to our service. I don't care how big of the issue, the challenge you may be going through. He is a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeping God. He's my God, and that's who he is. So I want you to trust him. I, I, you, you can lay everything at his feet. You can take the biggest problem you have, and you can lay it at his feet, and you can trust him. Can we pray? Father God, I thank you. God, time and time again, you have proven that you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. You are my God and that's who you are. And even when I can't see that you're working, you're still working. Even when I can't feel that you're working, you're still there working behind the scenes. For you are the mighty, powerful God. Lord, I thank you. I stand here on this platform one year later rejoicing that my son is alive. And he did not die. That my son is alive. But I thank you and I rejoice in that, Father. I will be eternally grateful that you came through and you performed miracle after miracle. Father, you brought my family through this crisis. God, I don't know what we would have done if it wasn't for you. If it wasn't for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, God, we would not have come through this. You were there, and you showed yourself real time after time after time. And I can stand here on this platform one year later and say, and tell these people, that they can trust you. They can lay their burdens at the foot of the cross and they can trust you. Father, I pray for every person that's carrying a burden right now. I pray, Father, that you would encourage them. I pray you would strengthen them. I come against the lies of the power of darkness. I come against the lies of Satan himself. Father, I pray that you would speak the words of life in Jesus' name. Father God, we lift up Pastor Pat before you today. And God, we're thankful that he is improving. He still has a long way to go. But God, we call upon the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon his physical body. And God, we speak this word that he will live and he will not die. Lord, I pray for a miracle. Lord, I pray that you would show up in that hospital in London and that you would show up and show off. 
I speak the healing virtue of Jesus Christ into his body. I pray for Jennifer. I pray for Rachel. I pray for Jeff and their f- prospective families. I pray for peace that surpasses all understanding that come upon them. I pray, God, you would strengthen them. I pray, God, that you would draw them closer to yourself in Jesus' name. Father, we commit this day into your hands. We thank you so much for who you are and what you do in our lives. You truly are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. You truly are. Father, encourage your people, strengthen your people. In Jesus' name, I pray this. And everyone said amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. I, I want to give a quick update on Pastor Pat. Um, I've been in contact with Rachel and Jennifer. Um, our district office also has contacted us to let us know that they're praying for uh, him as well. He's, I'm just going to grab my phone because I have an update I got last night uh, from Jennifer. So give me a second here. Update for my dad, Pat Pickle. He has had a, now I don't even know how to pronounce this word. I, I swear, I learned over the past little while, I think doctors sit in a dark room with no windows and just put letters together to make up these names of different things they do. But uh, I think it's called a tricky, tricheostomy. It's like when you do a tricky in there. Like these are there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yesterday for a few different reasons, but mostly important, it allows him to come off, uh, off of sedation and move to assisted ventilation when he is on the ventilator, but can uh, initiate when to take his own breath instead of being forced to breathe on the ventilator schedule. Uh, he, uh, he was weaned off sedation slowly uh, throughout the day. Today, that was yesterday. But he, uh, of this evening, he is not fully awake yet. He is doing well on initiating uh, the ventilating breathing, uh, small steps in a long journey, but some good small steps. Where he went in before, he had a uh, cardiovascular, um, I think it was an aneurysm, where they put a stint in. When they put the stint in, then they moved some veins, I believe, that were not supposed to be where they were from here under uh, one of the main arteries over to this side and reattached them. Uh, so there was swelling, so he couldn't breathe on his own. He was on the ventilator. A ventilator forces the oxygen into you, and you can only be on the ventilator for a certain period of time. And they were worried that he was going to be on for that time. So they did that trick in the neck there. Uh, he is improving, but he's still not out of the woods. So we really need to keep him in prayer and ask God to touch him in a special way. Amen? Okay. Just a couple announcements uh, that I have. Uh, again, uh, we'll probably give you updates as to uh, how things progress with the COVID-19. Uh, we are just glad that we're able to be here in the building. Isn't it great? So if uh, please, um, our board members are kind of doing the ushering, greeting things and so on. So if they instruct you to do something, even if you don't like it, please Listen to them. Uh, if they say, okay, you need to move over a little bit or because you're too close to somebody, because we're trying to keep everyone safe. So they have your best interest in their mind and that. So please work with them, cooperate with them. Uh, for giving, we're not receiving offerings. We, we can't do that. We're not going around shaking hands. We can't do that. We can't go and hug. Uh, as best as we can, when the service is done, we're closed in prayer. Uh, we need to vacate the building uh, relatively quickly we can't hang out in the lobby at least not right now we will soon but right now we can't so uh you know you you won't stress out our deacon board if we they gotta shoo you out the building they're not trying to be mean trust me they're not trying to be mean just that we don't want to have um our 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 privileges removed from us again we want to be able to continue doing so we need to abide by the guidelines whether we like them or not with offering, what we are doing, we are continuing with our online offering, our online giving, but we are going to encourage you uh, to do that as well. And also, um, 
we have our debit machine that's available. There'll be someone there, and they're going to wipe it down after each use, so you can use that. We have two offering plates at the back. Uh, so you, on your way out, if you still do the check thing or you got cash, whatever, you can walk by and just drop it off, and they will take care of it from there. So we can still do our giving, and I want to thank... I need to really thank those who have been really been faithful in their giving and their tithes uh, through this time. You guys have been amazing. You guys have been awesome. Let's keep it up. I don't know how long this is going to be. I have no long, uh, no idea how long we're going to be in this mode, but we will roll with the punches as they come. Amen? Amen. I'm going to go and change microphones on this one here. I wanted to talk. I tell you this message called, That's My Dad. And uh, I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to go to uh, Luke chapter 15, and we're going to look at verse 20 to 24. Luke 15, 20 to 24. And I have it up on the screen so you can see it. Uh, we took the Bibles out of the pews uh, because we can't have people, we got to like wipe things down now, we can't have people touch them. I want to encourage you, let's, let's, let's go back to yesteryear, and let's bring our own Bible to church. Or, we, yeah, you're right, we get out of the habit, and, or bring your electronic device. Just don't play Scrabble while we're preaching. If you could do it, wait till after to play Scrabble or Solitaire. So Luke chapter 15, verse 20 says, So he got up. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But and you need to understand what's going on here in this text. The father is interrupting the son. He says, but the father said to his servant, quick. Bring the best robe and put, uh, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us have a feast and celebrate. For this uh, son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they began to, se to celebrate. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be wonderful if our children always followed the footsteps of our faith? Wouldn't that be wonderful? It'd be exciting. It'd be awesome. Unfortunately, we know that it is not always so. Many times, uh, children of Christian parents go through seasons of rebellion or backsliding when they turn their backs upon the Christian faith of their family and they reject the values with which their parents raised them. No family is exempt from this possibility. None. Some of the most godliest parents who raise their children in the faith and in the church still have children who go astray. I think of Ruth and Billy Graham, their son Franklin, who for years walked away from his parents' faith. It, was, it is always possible because our children like us have sinful, carnal natures which can pull them away from God. And they are free, moral beings. They have a choice to choose. Who can make their own choices. And they do not always choose wisely or according to our wishes. I miss the days when my kids were little. And you can control them better. I know that sounds horrible. But, but they... they they did what you told them to. They didn't argue with you. They may have done a little temper tantrum, but that was back in the day where you could give them a little smack on the bottom and not worry about the police coming to your door. Trust me, I got a few of them on myself. My father made up this stick about this long. It was an oar that he carved and made it and wrote on the Board of Education. He said, I'm going to apply it to UC Learning. I made a mistake one time, and I said to my father, he says, he, he, he made the mistake to say to me, I'm doing this because I love you, son. And I made the mistake, and I looked back and says, Dad, I wish I was big enough and old enough to return your love. <laughs> that did not sit very well with my father. Of course, we want to give each of our children the freedom to grow and to develop into the person God desires them to be. We want that many parents have certain ideas and dreams of their children. And if we are wise, we understand that God may have different plans 
for our children than we do. And that's all okay. I don't have a problem with that. Our desire should simply be that our children will seek God and his will for their lives. I told my children, I had some of my kids would sit and say, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to go into the ministry. And I looked at them and said, then don't. If you're not called, don't go into the ministry. If you're called, I don't care what they do. I don't care who they are. As long as they're not some mob boss. <laughs> but I don't care what they do. It's okay for God may have a different idea, and that's okay. But I just want them to seek God. I want them to say, God, what is your will for my life? But all the heartache of grief of Christian parents when, they, when, when our children turn away from the faith and no longer want to seek God's will for their life. And, and this is a situation that's represented here in the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal never appears in the parable uh, Never appears in the parable anywhere else uh, uh, in, in Scripture for a matter. The word prodigal actually means wasteful. Wasteful. And the word became attached to the son in this parable because of the way that he wasted the shared inheritance of his father's estate. However, because this was also a son who had turned his back on God, and his family, the word prodigal, has also come to signify any wayward child. And so for us, a primary thought when we think of the prodigal child, it's not a child who's wasteful, but rather a child who's left God and home. It's a child who does not have to leave, physically leave the home to be a prodigal. There are plenty of prodigals who still live under the same roof of their parents, but they have left home in their hearts. They have put some distance between themselves and their parents. And a prodigal child can be of any age. There are many adult prodigal sons and daughters. Some have their own families. But because they have abandoned the Christian faith and the values of the parents, they are also called prodigals. And, and no matter how old you are, their parents still long for them to return to the faith. You never cease to become a parent. You're always a parent. It doesn't matter how old they are. There's a lot we could say about the prodigal son in this parable. But this morning I want to focus elsewhere. I don't want to talk about him. I want to talk about this being Father's Day. I want to talk about the prodigal's dad. And especially his actions in verses 20 to 24. In this parable, and, and, and in focusing on the prodigal's dad, I want us to consider this question. How should we, as Christian parents, respond <coughs> to our children when they do not follow the Christian faith? How should we respond? As parents of prodigal sons and daughters, what is the proper way to reach out to our children? What is a godly response? Many parents of prodigal, prodigals are in great pain over their children. We need to know how God would have us to respond to our children when they walk away from the Lord. Our natural reaction is to lecture, to nag, to get angry, to despair, and to finally give up. I walk through every one of those. Where you get to the point where you just you want to lecture the person because, and they say to you, well, you don't know. Yes, I do. You, and they say to you, you think you know more than I do. Well, you're a kid. I'm a full-grown adult. I better know more than you do. We all go through these things, but, but God shows us a better way, a way based on the promise and the character of God. In verses 20 to 24, in this parable, we are giving a beautiful picture of how the prodigal's father responds to his son. And this is a real picture, and it boils down to that this is a picture of how our heavenly father and how he responds to us when we go astray. And so this is also a picture of how we should respond to our children when they stray from the Lord. How did the prodigal's dad respond to his son? He demonstrated hope uh, in his son's absence, love and compassion when his son drew near, and joyful forgiveness when his son finally returned. So if you're taking notes, number one, parents of prodigals should demonstrate steadfast hope 
in their child's absence. Once again, this may either be physical absence or spiritual absence. Sometimes it's both. Either way, the child has left God in home, at least in their heart, and has thus distanced themselves often from their parents. These are very difficult days for parents. We long to see our children walking with the Lord. We, we know that, that only God's way is the path of protection and the progress for peace for our children. We know the way they should follow, but they're not following it. And it's hard on parents. We also know that when our children step away from God's plan for them, they will be inevitably bringing suffering and sorrow into their own lives. You walk away from God's protection. You open up the door for the enemy just to bring chaos and confusion into your life. And, and as a parent, as, as someone who's older and wiser, we see that. Why? Because we probably went through the same thing. We want to spare them the sorrow upon sorrow. But we can't make their choices for them. There comes a, a, a time where they have to make their own choices, and that's hard as a parent. Sin is a cruel taskmaster. And so our hearts ache for them and for, and for the difficult path that they chose. We know that they are entering rough waters ahead, and it's also unnecessary. We know that they can learn God's way either the hard way, and quite often they choose the hard way. I was like that. It seemed that that's where I abode most of the time was the hard way. And as the days and months and sometimes years of rebellion wear on, it tears on the heart of a parent. It's too easy to become discouraged and give up all hope of our child returning. This is when we need to depend upon God even more because with God in the picture, we need to never give up. There is always hope, always. The prodigal's dad in this parable is a wonderful example uh, for us in, in this regard. He never gave up hope that his son would return one day. In verse 20, he says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. While he was a long way off, his father saw him. I take this to mean that the father was looking for him. You don't usually notice things that are far off in the distance unless you are looking for them. I also don't think it was a coincidence that he just happened to be looking on the day of all days that his son was returning home. We are meant to understand that the father was looking every day. Every day. Seeking and asking God, bring my son back home. We are meant to understand he's looking every day. Every day he would scan the horizon looking for some sign of his son return. Why? Because he never gave up hope that his son would come back. He never stopped looking. I didn't ask Amanda to do that song, Reckless Love. But it talks about he, he never stops looking. There's no wall that he won't tear down. There's what well, some of the other parts of it. That there's nothing that will stop God from seeking you out. He will continue to look for you. As Christians, we have good reason not to give up hope. Our God can do all things. He's the one who can bring life from death. He, the one who can make a way where there is no way. Who makes the streams flow in the desert. God can melt heart of stone and, so, and soften the most rebellious spirit. He can turn the heart of a king. As Christians, we need to never give up hope. Because our God uh, is the Lord, the one almighty one who does great things for us. He is the one who can do it. This is why Jesus told us that we were, should always pray, never give up. 1 John 5 says this in verse 14 and 15. Tells us that we have confidence as we approach God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that he will, that we will have what we ask of him. As you bring your child before God in prayer, you may have the confidence that God hears your prayer and will answer. God never gives up on anyone, and neither should we. We may also take comfort in the passage from Proverbs 22, verse 6, where it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I've heard testimony after testimony after testimony, story after story of people who were raised in the Christian faith and their parents brought them to church. And, and when they got to that place where they make their own decisions, they, they walked away from it and said, I don't want this anymore. But they came back years later. And parents were praying and seeking God. they bring my son back, bring my daughter back, bring them back. Years later, they would say that there's this nagging voice. I remember the Sunday school lessons that I learned when I was a child. I remember the songs that we sang, and it kept coming back and back to my memory. See, the Holy Spirit, as you pray for your child that's wandering, the Holy Spirit, what some evangelists call him, the hound of heaven. You cannot get away from God. And they may be wandering for a while. They may be doing things that you sit there and say, oh, my dear God in heaven, what is next? But pray for them and ask God to bring back those things that you have taught them, that your Sunday school teacher has taught them, that your youth pastor has taught them, that they sat and listened to in a service. Ask God to bring those things back to their remembrance because it works. God does it. Scripture and Christian experience of both bear witness that the child who had been raised in the faith eventually will return. Some take longer than others, but pray that God will bring them back. So the first point was you should demonstrate steadfast hope in your child's absence. Number two, parents of prodigals should demonstrate love and compassion when their child draws near. Look at verse 20 again. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. See, parents of prodigal, prodigals should demonstrate love and compassion when their child draws near or is starting to draw near. The father in this parable never gave up hope. He was looking for his son every day. His son was absent. There, are, there were... Many long, hard days when he had no opportunity to express his love for his son. That's unfortunately how it often is with prodigals. The prodigal child distanced himself from his parents or her parents and from those who truly love him or her and desire to help. There are many, many times when we as parents have no opportunity to show our child how much we care, how much we love them. And like the father, we patiently wait and watch in the horizon looking for any sign that our child might be ready to return so we might have an opportunity to reach out to him or to her. When that opportunity arrives, and arrived for the prodigal's dad. He wasted no time. He saw his son approaching, even from far off in the distance. He felt compassion on his son, and he acted on it. I like the translation in the verse that says, in this verse, says, his heart went out to him. He saw his son in the distance, and his heart went out to him. The very moment his son began to draw near, the father responded with love and compassion. How did he demonstrate this compassion? He ran to his son, embraced him, kissed him. In running to his son, his father threw off all dignity and pride. In those days, it was considered undignified for a Jewish man to run. He would have had to lift up his skirt. They didn't wear pants like this. I got pretty good shoes on, pretty good pants, and I can still run pretty good. But they wore ropes and down to their feet. So he had to grab it up like this, pull it up like this, and pull it up so he'd have his, his knobby knee, bare legs showing. And he would grab it like this so he could run. And he did that and ran to his son. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? This old guy with these white, white, bony knee legs. Right now, my son is here. My son is coming. Running out, they think, they probably thought, this guy, this, he's lost it. He didn't care. It was undignified, but he didn't care. And he was, had to lift up the skirt. It was awkward. 
It just wasn't done. The prodigal's dad ran to his son. Why is this important to know this? Because the father thought more of his son than he did of himself. His heart went out to his son. And then he went out to him also in person. It was a sign of commitment. He didn't want his son to come all the way home first. He didn't want to even wait till he came halfway. At the first sight of his son in the distance, at the very first opportunity, he ran to him. He didn't want to take the risk of his son changing his mind and turning back around. Realize this. As our prodigal kids could be coming back, also realize the Holy Spirit is working on them, bringing them back to himself, bringing them back to the faith, bringing them back home. The enemy also is working on them, saying, you don't want to go. They're not going to accept you. What are you doing? You're going to make a fool of yourself. You go there this and you go there that. So we need to take the first step when we see them coming, putting aside our dignity, putting aside our pride. When he reached his son, he took him in his arms and he embraced him, a sign of welcome. Then he kissed him, which was a sign of parental affection. Notice the father did all of this even before the son spoke a word. At this point, he had no idea why his son had returned. For all he knew, his son came back to say, hey, you know what? I'm kind of out of money. I need some more money. What have you got? Can I borrow your debit card? How about the credit card? Can I have the keys of the car? It didn't matter. The father demonstrated love and compassion to his son at the very first opportunity. And we must do the same. Don't wait until your child comes all the way back before you reach out to them. Look for the first signs of return. And then reach out with love and compassion at that first opportunity. The prodigal's dad went running in his robe to meet his son. Parents, be willing to sacrifice your pride and your dignity rather than risking further estrangement. Demonstrate true commitment to your child. The prodigal's dad embraced his son. Don't hold back. Welcome your child with open arms. The prodigal's dad greeted his son with a kiss. Don't be distant. Be affir- affirm your love and affection to your child. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, where he says this. God's kindness is what leads us to repentance. Number three, parents of prodigals should demonstrate joyful forgiveness when the son returns home. And we look at those verses again, 21 to 24. The son said to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, stand on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill kill it. Let's have a feast and then let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Parents of prodigals, should demonstrate joyful forgiveness when their sons and their daughters return. What I mean by return in this is that when the child demonstrates a true confession and repentance of sins to their, when they come home, you should exercise love and compassion when your child draws near. Look at verse 21 where it says, The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, that's true confession. That's true heartfelt repentance. The son, son knew that he was wrong. He realized the pain that he caused his father, and he owned up to it. Parents, this is not time for a lecture, but rather for celebration and forgiveness. Speaking of lectures, which my kids will tell you I am an expert in, One of the reasons why most prodigals' kids don't come back home is they're dreading the lecture. Isn't it interesting that the prodigal son had prepared his own lecture in advance? Think about it. He prepared his own lecture. Did you ever notice that? It's almost as if he was trying to fend off his dad's lecture He's like, I know what my father's going to say. I know what my dad's going to say. So I, I'm, I'm going to beat him to the punch. <laughs> when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my fathers, in verses 9, 17 to 20, 
<laughs> How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go to my father's house and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. <coughs> he had his lecture, his speech already rehearsed. I could see him walking down the road. Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven, against you. I am not worthy to be your son. Make me one. And he would go over this and over this and over this and over this. You know how arguments work. You know how when you come into a confrontational situation, how you go over the, the, the things in your mind, in your head, so you have everything in place. He has own lecture memorized, rehearsed and ready to go. And when his dad came out to meet him, the prodigal didn't waste any time. It's like he wanted to, be, to beat his dad to the punch. Fortunately, the prodigal's dad was too excited about his son's return and it, it, it didn't waste any time on the lecture. In fact, he didn't even let his son finish his own speech. He interrupts him and says, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is now found. And they begin to celebrate. You see, when we confess our sins to God, he doesn't hit us with a lecture. He forgives us. David testifies and says, I will confess my transgressions in Psalm 32, 5. I will confess my transgressions before the Lord, and God will chew me out. God will make me feel really bad. God will download a whole thing of guilt on me. No, it doesn't say that. Let's read it what it really says. I will confess my transgressions before the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Bottom line. End of the road. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. That's how God treats us when we return to him. If we want to be godly parents, we must treat our prodigal sons and daughters the same way. Confessing prodigals don't want to hear, I told you. They don't need to be told they're wrong. They already know it. And when they return and repent, all they really need is forgiveness. And not just a token forgiveness, but sincere, joyful, celebrating forgiveness. Not wasting time reprimanding them for all the things they've done wrong, but simply rejoicing that they have returned home. Some parents have a, a lecture already memorized. Don't go there. Don't go there. I want to close off with three things very quickly. In verse 22, in verse 22, the father presents the son with three things. And they're very significant for us to know. A robe, a ring, and a pair of sandals. He presents these things to his son. And they were spoken volumes. The first thing was he, he dressed his son in the best robe in the house. The best robe was a sign of honor. Think about it. The son had dishonored God and his family by his action. He had de demanded his inheritance early, ran off on his own, had wasted it all. He had sunk to the bottom and came back defeated and disgraced. He fully expected to be made one of the hired hands of the house. If he was lucky, but the father would have none of that. He didn't even have any guarantee that his father would even accept him back. He dressed his son instead in the best robe of the house, a robe of honor which showed nothing could change his relationship with his father. In honor, he restored him in his relationship as a son. Secondly, he put the ring on the son's finger. The ring was a sign of love, friendship, and loyalty. We still use rings as a covenant pledge today, either in friendship or marriage. I have a ring. I've had several rings because I'm very hard on my rings. I bend them. So my wife got this one. You could probably run it over with a transport truck because I bend all the other ones. When my wife put this ring, not this one, but ring like this, on my finger when we said our vows, it was an eternal covenant we made to each other, the same way I put her ring on her finger. 
She still has her rings because she's not as hard on her rings as I am. A ring symbolized friendship or marriage. So what did the ring say to the son? It was as if the father was saying to him, son, now you got to get this. Son, no matter what happens, even if you should leave me again, let this ring be a reminder of my unconditional love for you. No matter what you do, you're always my son now and forever. Third thing was sandals. We're a sign of freedom and belonging. Only free men wore sandals, not slaves. Only those who lived in the home wore sandals in the house. The guests would take them off upon arrival. And so the father was saying to the prodigal, you are not a slave. You're not even a guest in my house. You are my son in every way. You are free and you belong to this home. The father extended to his son full forgiveness and restoration. So let me close. How should we respond to our children, those that are prodigal, whether son or daughter, like this son, with hope, love, and forgiveness? First, you need to demonstrate steadfast hope in your child's absence. Never give up on them. Pray for them. Secondly, show love and compassion when your child draws near. Keep scanning the horizon for the first signs of change. If you're praying for your children to change, then believe and look for them to come home. It's like if you're praying for rain, don't leave your house without an umbrella. If you're praying for your children to come back to the faith, scan the horizon and watch for their return. Thirdly, finally, demonstrate joyful forgiveness when your child returns. When they return, don't do the lecture. Instead, forgive, restore, and celebrate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. I thank for each and every father in this house today. I pray, God, that you would just encourage them. I pray you would strengthen them. There are some fathers here that have prodigal sons and daughters. I pray faith would rise up in their heart and they would continue to pray and and have hope for the return of their child to you that they would scan the horizon, they would watch, and they would believe for a miracle. And God, when their children return, God, help us to forget the lecture and just throw our arms around our children and tell them how much we love them. And with their heads bowed and their eyes closed, and maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching us online, or maybe you're sitting in your vehicle in the parking lot, If you're under the listening of my voice, maybe you are a prodigal. You even say, well, I'm here at church. You can still come to church and still be a prodigal in your heart. I want to pray for you this morning. If you're watching us online, I want to pray for you as well. Maybe you you have drifted away from God. Maybe you have, have drifted in your relationship with him. He wants you to come home. He loves you so much. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. And he loves you so much. He just wants you to come home. So I want to pray for you. If you're here today, if you're watching online, listening in your vehicle, I want to pray a prayer that will help to bring you home to your father. And if that's you, I want you to say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me. I have had a relationship with you in the past. But I have allowed my sin. I've allowed my pride. I've allowed this world to draw me away from you. God, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I return to you today. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to follow you the rest of my days. I pray this in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for anyone that might have said that prayer in their heart. 
I pray that you would make yourself real to them. I pray that you would show yourself to them and that you would seal that prayer by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, as we get ready in a moment or two to go our separate ways, thank you again, Father, for the privilege of us being able to come and worship here today. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Um, have a great day. We'll see you again next Sunday. Again, please cooperate with us on the whole COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, so try not to bunch up in the lobby and fellowship and that. We're going to be able to get back to it soon, very soon. Thank you for coming. Have a great day.